otters are there across India. Um, you'll find them in the Himalayas, in central India, in peninsular India, but we don't know much about them. And you know, they're carnivores and small mammals. Animals like otters don't get as much attention as maybe tigers or elephants, but they're also like equally important in our ecosystems. Hi, my name is Vinnie Jain and I work at Centre for Wildlife Studies. I'm a research fellow there. Uh, I've been working at Centre for Wildlife Studies since 2018 and currently I'm doing a research project studying otters in central India. So the reason I chose to study otters is that, you know, they're, it's, they're so data deficient, we don't know a lot about them. I think that it's really important to generate more information about these mysterious animals in India. Uh, I also think otters are extremely, like personally, I think otters are extremely cute, they're charismatic, they're fun. But yeah, for our ecosystems, they're really important. And I think that we should do more research on otters and other lesser known species in India. So otters are basically carnivores and they're aquatic, they're mammals. So otters can be found in aquatic habitats of any kind. So you'll find them in rivers, you'll find them in lakes, mangroves, um, estuaries, and uh, there's even sea otters that you can find in the ocean. In India, we have otters in mangroves, rivers, and lakes. We don't have marine otters. Um, and yeah, otters are aquatic. They eat uh, aquatic prey, so they eat fish, crabs, shrimp, prawn. But like all carnivores, they're extremely opportunistic, so they'll eat anything that they can get their hands on. But um, they're specifically evolved to eat fish and other aquatic prey. Like I said, otters are carnivores, and carnivores in general tend to exert huge influence on ecosystems. So whenever you remove a carnivore from an ecosystem, it usually has um, you know, detrimental effects for the vegetation and for all of the prey species involved. Um, and generally speaking, um, you know, for example, in any river or lake, if otters are present, um, the fish communities in that ecosystem will be hugely influenced by otters, right? Because otters are feeding on them on a daily basis. So things like the evolution of the fish or things like the community composition of the fish will be affected by otters. Because of their role as carnivores and the resulting effect that they play on the ecosystem, um, we can't underestimate the role that they play. And though we don't have any quantifiable data, we don't from India, we don't have any quantifiable studies that show, okay, this is what happens when you remove otters versus this is what happens when you have otters. Although we don't have such data yet, it's safe to say that they do play important roles in our ecosystems. Studies have been done on marine otters, which show that when marine otters are present in a habitat, um, because marine otters f feed on sea urchins, um, sea, the sea urchin population gets controlled and the sea urchins don't pre prey as much on the kelp forests. So having otters present is beneficial for kelp forests. So in a similar way, uh, otters in our ecosystems in India are, are probably playing a very important role and based on our existing knowledge of ecosystems and our, and our existing knowledge of the role that carnivores play and the role that otters play in other ecosystems, it's safe to say that we should definitely care about otters being present. So we have three species of otters in India. So we have small clawed otters. Uh, small clawed otters are, uh, they're very small uh, and they are the smallest species of otters present on earth actually. We also have smooth coated otters. Smooth coated otters are very charismatic. They're very well known um, and you might have seen them in documentaries from India because they tend to stay together in groups and when they're together in groups of 10, 10 to 12, they're so intimidating that they can scare off tigers, that they can scare off crocodiles. So smooth coated otters have uh, evolved this unique defense mechanism or unique um, you know, way to survive, which is to stay together in these huge groups. And they're extremely fun to watch. Uh, and we also have Eurasian otters. Um, Eurasian otters are there across Eurasia. So Eurasian otters are there in the UK, in Norway, in Russia, and some Eurasian otters are even there in Africa. So we also have Eurasian otters, but we, we don't know um, currently how closely Eur these Eurasian otters are related to the Eurasian otters in the UK, for example, or whether we have a completely separate subspecies altogether. I mean, all of these things we don't know that much about. But yes, we have three species of otters. So 
my work focuses on a specific landscape. So I wanted to study otters um, in the Kana Bench Corridor. That uh, area consists of a lot of very rich forests, but also, you know, people. And uh, I really wanted to study otters there. So the intention of my study was to see what species are there, are there multiple species, and what is the distribution of otters in that landscape. So I went in with a landscape focus. The way that we do research on wildlife or on ecosystems, it totally depends on your question. So my question was, where do you get otters in this landscape? How widely are they distributed? Uh, what are the factors that affect their distribution? And what kind of habitats do they prefer? And what species are there? When you're looking at these kind of questions, when, when we want to study animals, you know, like we want to study the distribution of animals, there's a lot of different methods that you can use. Um, and it depends on the species that you're studying. In general, in India, when we, study th when we study tigers or when we study other carnivores, even when we study elephants, we do these things called sign surveys. So sign surveys is basically, um, you kind of um, divide your study area into grids or into however, however you want to divide it. And you try to do sampling, like statistical sampling. So in each uh, sample area, which is, you've, let's say you divide it into grids. So in each grid, you say that I want to sample three kilometers or I want to sample four or five kilometers based on the size of your grid. And you then walk along either a forest trail or along whatever habitat it is that you're studying. And you look for signs of that animal being present. So we, we basically, if you're studying um, tigers, for example, you would look for tiger pug marks or you would look for tiger scat. After we collect this data, we do some statistical stuff so that we know that uh, the results that we're getting are accurate. And when it comes to doing field studies like these, um, usually the challenges are that the landscapes are huge, the terrain is challenging, there's a lot of um, safety risks. So field, field collecting data on field is very different from kind of collecting data in a lab and it's uh, challenging in its own ways, you know. And uh, so for otters, what we did was we were walking, we were doing sign surveys along rivers and uh, I had a team of volunteers to help me out because we, it was a huge landscape and the, the, covering all of the rivers with just a team of two or three is impossible. So we had a team of volunteers, we would walk along rivers and we would note down whenever we saw otter scat or we saw otter tracks. And of course, if we ever saw otters, then that's also presence. So it's like doing a presence absence survey. Um, one other method that I used was is called camera trapping. Because with otters, um, you know, using the tracks or using the scat, you can't really identify the species. So in, uh, uh, in my landscape, we also set up um, these cameras that get triggered by movement. So um, we set them up in locations where we think order activity is there. And we set them up for, let's say, like 20 nights. And then we come back, we check the SD card, and we try to see if we captured orders or not. So the challenges are completely unique based on the species that you're studying. And um, I personally find all of this very interesting. Like, I'm very interested in biodiversity monitoring. Um, and it's very interesting because uh, it's the challenges are all based on the type of camera that you're using, the type of animal that you're studying, what landscape you're in. Um, so for example, with tigers, uh, one huge advantage that we have is that tigers have stripes, right? So because tigers have stripes, we, you can identify uh, each individual tiger based on the stripe pattern. And once you can count individuals, it becomes a lot easier to estimate the number. But with an animal like an otter or an animal like a dhole, like a wild dog, or any other, you know, an animal that doesn't have patterns, you have to look at something else to uniquely identify them. So for elephants, um, uh, scientists look at the folds in their ears or the shape of their tusks um, or, you know, the wrinkles on their body. I mean, there's all of these ways to ID individual elephants as well. So then, okay, let's say you want to ID individuals. Uh, then you have to figure out a way to set up your cameras in such a way that you get a high enough quality image that you can get the stripe pattern or you can get the, you know, the folds of the ear. So setting up the camera at the correct height, setting it up with the correct settings, setting it up at the right angle, all of these things are uh, really important. And even when you do all of that, the most important thing is that the animal should trigger the camera and that the animal should be there and it shouldn't be 
reacting to the presence of a camera. So in some landscapes, people have found that elephants will just see the camera. They're very smart. They'll step on it or they'll destroy it. So they've had to develop, uh, you know, elephant proof cases for the cameras. Um, sometimes what happens is tigers will uh, walk at night and the cameras will get triggered and the flash will get triggered. So they'll start avoiding those paths. So uh, it's kind of trial and error. And there's been an enough trial and error now that we use, we just have kind of fixed protocols, at least for tigers and elephants, there's fixed protocols that we use. Um, for otters, because there was no fixed protocol, a lot of what we did on field was trial and error. And, um, you know, um, it, we found out a lot of things. And one of the major things that we found out was that for us, camera trapping just didn't work because um, I don't know if it was the type of camera that we were using or the places that we were setting it up in, but we just couldn't capture otters, even though we knew they were there. We would see fresh signs in the morning, but we still wouldn't see them on the camera trap. So there's all of these kind of issues. You, you, you know, when we, because this was something new that we were trying, it was a, it involves a lot of trial and error, and that is why um, research and science are you know done the way that they're done, because when you then take all of the findings that all of the stuff that we faced and all of our results when we publish it into a paper, we'll include every single detail of the methods that we used, how we went about it, what we found, what were the challenges. When this gets reviewed by experts and published in a journal, that information is then available to anyone. And so as more and more papers get published, the body of knowledge keep gets, keeps getting built and you know, uh, no one has to go and spend waste time or money doing what I did again. Yes, it's absolutely essential to study the habitat as well. So, for example, um, when we were studying otters, we were walking five kilometers along rivers and we had divided it up into segments of 100 meters each. So at every 100 meters, we would collect certain information about the habitat, such as the width of the river or the flow of the river, the substrate. And collecting all this kind of environment, um, you know, uh, habitat data is really important because um, one of my questions was, you know, how does habitat affect otter presence? Um, so yeah, based on your question, based on the kind of information you're hoping to collect, we usually do collect habitat information as well. And it totally depends on the animal that you're studying and the kind of question that you have. People who are involved in things like the management of wildlife, people who are involved in managing forests and protected areas, which in India is the forest department. For them, this data is extremely useful. Um, they often don't have the uh, manpower or the scientific capability right now to do such studies. Um, so this kind of data is stuff that they can't generate on their own. So, um, you know, they it, it's, it's really uh, useful for them to know what animals are there, what species are there, where are they, and you know, what are the threats that they're facing. But the fact of the matter remains that when something is published as research, that doesn't necessarily mean that it will, you know, anything will be done about it. So the gap between research and policy or the gap between research and impact is actually quite a difficult one to fill because um, doing research is one thing, it's collecting data and publishing it. But having an impact, having a positive change involves so much more work and it involves so much more time. Um, so research is one step of a much, much larger and a much more complicated process. So for us to make a difference for freshwater ecosystems, for rivers, for otters, it requires a lot of work. It, it, it requires us to not only engage with communities that uh, live in those areas, it requires us to engage with, you know, uh, farming practices and things like industries uh, to understand if there's pollution hap in the river, to understand where that pollution is coming from who's responsible for it. And even once we know that, how can we ever convince people to change? Or how can we ever, um, how can we ever make these threats go away? You know, so that is a much larger process. And I think that conservationists in India are still figuring this out. Um, I think that for otter conservation, a lot of important steps include, um, you know, engaging with fisher, fisher communities, because sometimes, um, their engagement with otters leads to negative interactions, to understand if there are nets that are killing otters, if there's poison fishing happening or dynamite fishing happening, because that's very destructive. Um, it's really important to reduce things like illegal sand mining. Um, it's really important to um, make sure that our um, fish uh, communities are not getting depleted by overfishing. So it's so complicated. There's so many different um, factors involved.
as people who are working in non-profits, we do the best that we can when it comes to engaging with communities. We do, we do the best that we can when it comes to engaging with businesses. But I think that we have a long, long, long way to go in India. And uh, I think that it's, it's just going to take a lot of time, effort and building on the work of pe what people have already done. We didn't find any religious or cultural association that people have with otters, but we found some kind of um, superstitions that people have, I think because otters are so mysterious and because Eurasian otters only come out at night. So people, um, a lot of people uh, told us that they think that otters dig dead bodies out of graves, that they eat dead bodies, that they live near cemeteries or that they live near um, burial grounds. Um, we also found uh, that people uh, have the superstition that if someone is walking at night near a water body, then otters will come out and pull, pull them into the water. But in general, I think people have mostly very neutral at attitudes towards otters because it's not something that they encounter very frequently and it's not something that um, affects their day-to-day -day life. Um, but this is th this I'm talking about from a general perspective, but from the perspective of a fisherman or a fisher fishers who spend a lot of their lives near the water and who frequently go and fish, they encounter otters quite frequently and they have a bit more, uh, they have more negative perceptions, but they also have a lot of traditional eco ecological knowledge about otters. So when when we ask fishers, you know, what they know about otters, they know a lot. They'll say, Ki, yeah, they eat fish, they eat crabs. Actually, I've seen one or two different kinds of otters over here. They, ha they have a lot of traditional eco ecological knowledge about these animals, but mostly it's kind of neutral. So what we do is to have it, uh, to make an impact and to have a positive change. We want to preserve biodiversity in wild spaces and we want our ecosystems to remain intact, right? Um, so I think that reaching that those targets is very challenging. I think that um, while there, there's two aspects to this. So doing the actual research itself has its own challenges because we often have to do field work in remote areas. We have to, uh, you know, uh, spend a lot of time collecting that data. It requires a lot of manpower, labor, effort, and time. Um, but the other aspect of it is then, how do you make a positive change? I think that aspect of it is very challenging. And I think that even assessing or assessing the impact, figuring out whether or not you've had a positive impact because you did something, it's very difficult. And um, that's something that people in conservation are really working hard on, you know. So um, if I had to summarize all the challenges that we face, uh, face in a few sentences, I would say that the things that we want as a country, right? We want development or we want there to be economic progress. We want there to be more businesses and we want people to have better standards of living. It's the problem with our um, field is that everything that we're doing does not align with those goals and actually goes against them. So we're constantly kind of swimming against this tide of like rapid change that keeps happening. And it's not that we're, it's not that I as a person or, you know, the other people who work in this field, it's not that we're against development or against economic um, progress, but it's just that finding the balance between sustainability and conservation and against what is the primary agenda of mostly everyone is is really difficult and sometimes what we're just looking for is balance we're not even saying you know stop businesses or halt industries we're just trying to look for people to adjust things in a way that makes it easier for wildlife to also survive or for ecosystems to remain intact but even doing that when it's against things like more money or when it's against things like more employment then it's really really hard to convince people and sometimes it becomes hard to even convince yourself. So staying motivated in this field, um, staying motivated, um, feeling like you are doing something that needs to be done even when a lot of people around you might be telling you that it's not necessary. It's, it's difficult to stay motivated and it's difficult to convince people that, that these things are important. So I would say that's... and then you're making sure your work has an impact. Again, you're faced with like a thousand barriers because you know, it's everyone loves, uh, you know, uh, everyone loves wildlife on paper. Everyone loves on paper to donate to things like WWF. But when it's affecting your income or when it's affecting uh, your business, you will never be pro conservation. So that's when it becomes really challenging, you know.
So yeah, I started working in conservation um, after my master's and it's been three, or three to four years since I've started working in this field. And I've learned so much. I think a lot of uh, having been, having studied biology, I had so many perceptions about nature and wildlife, which are simply not true. Um, you, we tend to think of um, forests and we tend to think of when we think of tigers and leopards and otters, we think of them in living inside forests and completely separate from people, but that's not true. Um, I've seen otters in rivers where there's people coming every day to bathe, to wash their clothes, to wash their dishes. And you know, the way that wildlife and people overlap in India and across the world, I, I think that that's something that I've now learned to appreciate. Um, for example, you might be surprised to know that there's leopards that walk around in Bangalore, there's leopards that walk around at night in Bombay. So the line between us and nature is actually very blurry and um, we're, we're much, and yeah, the, the proximity between wildlife, wild spaces and human communities is, is very, it's, they're very close, you know, to each other. Something that I've learned, uh, I was trained, uh, I was trained in biology and so I was always trained to look at things from an ecosystem perspective or from a biological perspective. And I went into this field hoping to study ecosystems and be an ecologist. But as I got more into conservation, um, it becomes abundantly clear that conservation is not a problem that can be solved using biology or ecology. Conservation is a social problem, it's an economic problem. So in order to solve environmental challenges that we have in India and across the world, we need social scientists, we need economists, we need psychologists, we need people who understand human behavior. We need to uh, involve people who understand human societies. Um, so yeah, as what I've learned is that conservation is very much a social issue more than it is something that needs um, ecologists. We need, we need more uh, interdisciplinary people and we need to involve communities and we need to involve stakeholders in order to have an impact. So um, my uh, research on otters, I'm hoping to publish it. I'm also hoping to continue working with otters in the future in India. Um, but more generally, I hope to fill these gaps that I was talking about throughout this interview. I really uh, feel passionately about interdisciplinary research and I really feel that um, we need to do more in India to engage with businesses and industries to achieve our environmental and conservation targets. Going forward, I really hope to continue doing research, but I want to be more involved in the part that comes afterwards, which is how to make an impact, how to engage with stakeholders, how to create effective policies, how to engage with businesses, and how to engage with industries, and all of those kind of things to reduce human impacts on the environment. There has been a lot of progress in conservation recently to involve people from different disciplines, like I was saying. Uh, and I think more and more people are uh, recognizing the role of social science and things like anthropology and economics and all of that kind of stuff. I do think though that we still are within quite a bubble. Getting our message across or getting our research there's so much research that's happening. We have so much information, we have so much data. So getting all of this across to the people who can actually make a change, to people who are there in the central government or who are there at the state government levels, doing conservation at a local level also, I think is really important. So I think that we can do a lot more in terms of engagement with the right people rather than just general outreach. And I think that we can make a lot more progress in making conservation more well known amongst decision makers.